see the benefits, I believe. But the really critical thing is that we have to continue following instructions. We have to continue following social distancing. Because if we don't, the virus will start to spread again. Lots of you have built your own boards during the lockdown situation and if you have done that then well done. What a brilliant thing to do and something that will really really help your climbing not just in this period but going forward into the future. A board is such an amazing tool for improving your climbing because it's intense enough to really get those strength gains in your fingers, but also it gives you strength and technique through the whole body. Lots of you have been in touch asking me how I structure my sessions and you're obviously wondering how to structure sessions yourself. If you know, you're used to climbing outdoors or going to the climbing wall and just going through the circuits of set problems that have been put there for you. There are a few principles that I use, but they're, they're really simple. There's nothing rocket science about them. One of the core aspects of it is that I try to have fun in my sessions and I try to make them inspiring. Something that I've talked about before in fingerboarding and climbing training videos in general is that in order to gain strength, you need to try really, really hard. And in order to try really, really hard, you have to be motivated. And in order to be motivated, you have to be inspired. So I try to make a climbing wall an inspiring place. And in many ways, the, the way I set the problems is trying to replicate what I do in my real bouldering anyway, which is to have projects that I work on to success, you know, hopefully. Hopefully you make progress towards a project and then you do it and then you feel good about that. And that's, that drives you on, it drives you to try hard and trying hard is what drives your muscles to get stronger. So that's a very simple principle, but a very important one. But let me just step back and go through some other principles of how I actually build up a session. So number one, the starting place. The very first and probably most important thing about the session is what time you go to bed. <laughs> Sleep is the foundation for your adaptation to training. Without good sleep, Training will make you worse. Training, you will break yourself against training. So the first part of the session is to go to bed at a nice early time and to observe all of the other rules of circadian rhythm regulation, which is quite a big subject and something I might tackle in another video and get a good high quality sleep. I would say that um, one aspect of circadian rhythm, which is looking at digital screens late in the evening and therefore disrupting your melatonin production, is probably my biggest weak area in my training protocol. It's the obvious thing to try and fix, and it's obviously a hard thing to fix, as I'm sure many of you can relate to. 
I need to really discipline myself to turn off that screen because I need to work, I need to do more. There, there's, when you're self-employed, you never have enough time to, to finish your work and you're always behind. So there's always that pressure to keep going later and later into the night. Um, but at a certain point, it just destroys your training gains. It, and I mean destroys them. It just, I, I think also as I get older, I really notice that uh, more and more that without a good sleep, the training session the next day is a complete waste of time. In fact, it's worse than a waste of time. It will make you worse. Then the next part is actually fueling your training, you know, making sure your diet is good enough quality and is adequate in energy to actually fuel the training itself. Again, that's a big subject, something I'll go through specifically in other videos. If you want to ask questions about that, um, things that I do, you can do that. I might also do a video about what I am actually eating right now during the coronavirus lockdown. Although, as it always is, I'm always doing experiments in myself and it's always changing a little bit. So with those foundations in place, you come to the board itself and what you actually do in the board. And obviously a big factor that dictates how you use the board is how you set it. And again, there's no hard and fast rules to this. I set it basically how I like to climb on it. But how I like to climb on it is I like to have some of some warm ups, some big jugs to warm up on, some big holes that I can use as endurance circuits. And many of the problems and circuits have more than one purpose because you're managing a lot of a lot of roles, a lot of tasks for the climbs in quite a small space. So I warm up on parts of my easy endurance circuits or and then I'll very quickly progress to warming up on my easier boulder problems. For example, some of the circuits I have, like this white one here, is a really hard circuit that goes up the board, back down the middle, and then up one side. But so that the up, down, up parts in themselves as three boulder problems are quite low to moderate grades. So they, they are very, very useful for the, the later stages of the warm up, but linked together, they're absolutely desperate. <laughs> So I start off with just moving around on the jugs very, very gently and progress to easier boulder problems, progress to harder boulder problems, progress to bits of my hard projects, like a move, a couple of moves, the easier moves in the project and go from there. And then for the meat of the session, the actual hard bouldering part, I kind of flip between two different strategies. One strategy is to have a cadre of set problems that I work through that I have done before, I know the difficulty of. The difficulty of, of them is, is either quite high or very high. So that is, I can either consistently claim them first or second try if I'm feeling strong, but only if I'm feeling strong. And then there's some that even if I'm feeling strong, it'll still take me a few tries to claim them. So I'll maybe do some of them a bunch of times and let's say there's like five to 10 problems and then I can I work my way through them. If I'm feeling strong that day, if the conditions are good, then I might succeed on most or all of them. If things are not quite perfect, then I might not succeed on them. And if I feel quite tired, then I might move on to other parts of the session quite quickly. The other strategy, which I actually prefer even more, is just to have board projects, which is hard boulder problems, often quite long ones, or as long as as long as you can practically do on the board with a fair bit of going across and then up or di like diagonally and then diagonally back the way um, to give you something that you can work towards and that can be working towards in one session or it can be working towards for <laughs> multiple seasons or all sorts of things in between and really the more the more board projects of a variance of difficulty you have on the board I think the better that gives you a lot of variety to work on both your strengths, which is important, and also to work on your weaknesses, which is equally important, um, and to have a variety of claims that keeps you interested and keeps you motivated, and also allows you to switch between things according to how fatigued you feel. For instance, a couple of sessions ago, I was trying a problem on some really small gray crimps on the board behind me, um, really, really hard projects that um, I'm actually really pleased because I've made, made, been making a lot of progress with them. But after climbing them for a session, even after a rest day, those really tweaky, nasty little crimps just felt a little bit hard on my finger joints. I felt like, whoa, 
Everything else is recovered, but my finger joints are, they just feel a little bit tweaky. So I switched to these big purple holds and I was trying that, plus some other problems that were similar that are bigger, slopier, more powerful in nature um, as an alternative. And maybe I'll try them for a couple of sessions and then I'll move back to the crimpy ones again. So as you move from session to session, or at least I do, I'm mixing it up. I'm introducing variety according to how I feel, what I'm motivated to do, and also how my body feels and is responding to the training, how the conditions are, and integrating all those things and kind of making decisions on what I want to do during the session. So I might warm up. Two sessions ago, I warmed up and it was like the first nanosecond I stepped onto the board, I realized that I was going to have a good session. And it's quite often like that. And the, the more sensitivity you have to your recovery state, the, the better really. So I knew that I felt well recovered, well rested, and I felt strong and the conditions felt good. So I knew that I should try some really hard projects and I actually ended up doing a couple of them, uh, which was most gratifying. The session after that, I just didn't feel so good. Conditions were a bit warmer, a little bit more humid. I maybe hadn't slept quite so well, not being quite disciplined enough with that early bedtime. And so I just didn't feel quite so good. Maybe the difference in absolute strength could be like 2%. But on your hard projects, that's the difference between succeeding and not succeeding. So therefore, when I was warming up, I realized that and I switched to climbing some slightly easier things that were different in character. I, I was climbing on these big pinches um, and just, you know, a different, different variety of, of problems. So as a general rule, I warm up, I do my boulder problems for, I don't like to say a certain time because it just varies depending on my recovery state. If I feel really, really good, I might boulder for two or three hours. If I don't really feel good, then I might boulder for just an hour. But an hour on your own board that you know well, especially when you're climbing on your own, is pretty intense. That's actually quite a lot of climbing. So, you know, don't feel that if you've only climbed for an hour of hard bouldering that you haven't done enough because there's a lot of activity in that, especially if you have quite a high work rate and you're jumping on again quite quickly. But generally speaking, if you have a reasonable degree of fitness, as I think I do, then I've got a fair bit of time before my power starts to go off. Usually what starts to go first is my skin and to climb hard boulder projects on my board, I kind of need good skin. So what I often do is I'll have the bouldering block for whatever, an hour or, so, hour or two, and then I'll move on to doing fingerboard, campus board. And I'll, let's say like today I did um, half an hour campus board, maybe a little bit less than that, maybe 20 minutes. And then I did half an hour fingerboard, my normal fingerboard session, which I've spoken about in previous videos. And then after that, I moved on to some other general strength workouts. I did a rings workout, I did a bunch of rings exercises, and then I did a few other floor exercises, and then that was me. The previous session, um, instead of moving on to the rings and body strength exercises, I went on to endurance circuits. And when you're doing endurance circuits, there's obviously all the different levels. Now people characterize the different levels of endurance circuits as being aerobic and anaerobic. So I, I generally have circuits which are maybe, maybe four different levels. There is low intensity, which is the type of circuit where I can go around it all day long. And I do tend to go for sets of 20 minutes to an hour, but I generally do that on my 15 degree board. I'm lucky enough to have two angles. Then the next level up would be low to moderate intensity. And I have that on these white, big white holds you can see here. Pretty juggy, but with still with small footholds and quite long, quite a lot of moves. And I'll just go round and round that. So that'd be like sets of maybe 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. Then the next level up from that, I have a few circuits which are pretty pumpy to get round even once. In fact, if I'm really not fit and I haven't done any endurance work, I can only get around them once. But if I'm really fit, I can go around them three times, maybe four times, maybe five times at a push. So that would mean that the, the time to complete those circuits, it would be like two minutes to go around once, building up to 
five or six minutes to go around three times. And again, it's tricky to, to say what the intensity is because you go around the circuit, you come back to a, a juggy shakeout on one side, it's lower in intensity. So, so does that count as a rest or does that count as another circuit? It's very difficult to pin down these definitions. Then I also have a few harder circuits, which I can only get around once if I'm going really, really well. In fact, I have one on these yellow holes behind me, which is like a crisscross, quite a long circuit. Um, I don't know what grade it is, but it's pretty basically my limit. And I, I just managed to complete it for the first time the other day. Um, so I have two or three of those, and I'll maybe do them like three times maximum in a session because I just couldn't even try anymore. I wouldn't be able to do the moves if I tried to do them more times. That's like red pointing at a, a sport route that's at your absolute limit. And so from session to session, I would mix up how I do those endurance circuits. I also have some project circuits in the same way that I have project boulder problems. I have, I mentioned before that I was trying this crimpy grey problem on my board, which currently is a project just to do the up problems. Now this is like a circuit that goes round the whole board as one big boulder problem, and then a shorter circuit that goes round one half of the board. But ideally the whole circuit is to go round the whole thing, the whole loop, so that's like two loops of the board. And that's a long-term project for me. It's great because like, it's, a, it's a goal that stands there that you know that if I could ever get fit enough, strong and fit enough to climb that whole circuit, then I could climb my dream <laughs> goals um, in, in outdoor climbing. So just to recap on the decision-making of how I actually structure the session, there's really three factors. There's the components of training that I know I want to get in a given time period, whether that be a week or a month. You know, I want to do so many endurance sessions, so many hard boulder problems. I don't think about that in terms of numbers. I just think about that in my head as a kind of rough amount. And I also measure that by how my progress is in my training. I know if I'm going backwards on something, which is often endurance, because that will increase and also decrease quite quickly, then you know I need to do something about that quickly uh, if I want to reverse that. So there's that aspect which I kind of hold in my head and I make decisions on, but it's still on a fairly intuitive basis. I don't, I don't tend to write my sessions down or plan them in that way. I occasionally do if I have a very specific goal. Then there's what I feel like doing. There's what actually inspires me to pull hard and enjoy the session and show up and actually complete the session. So I would say that's probably the strongest factor that dictates the planning of my session to session is what I feel like doing. Would I like to try that boulder problem? And quite often I take a work your weaknesses approach to choosing which boulder problems to focus on. If I'm feeling really strong on a certain style of boulder problem, like really small crimps or big moves or whatever, then it's tempting or it would be tempting to do more of that because you're feeling good at it. I tend to do the opposite. If I'm feeling good at it, I kind of enjoy that moment of say completing a board project, but then I almost immediately move on to think, well, what am I weak on at the moment? And I, I keep switching it up to, to keep looking at those weak areas. So overall, although there is some structure, there is some thought that goes into it, broadly, I still just go bouldering and try to enjoy myself. <laughs> and I think that is kind of underrated. If I feel tired and I don't feel like I'm responding, I will not be afraid to step back, take a rest day, take two rest days and rethink the strategy. So if you have built a board, then do enjoy training on it. It's brilliant fun. I certainly love board climbing and look forward to enjoying putting those gains into practice back on the rock in the not too distant future.